Hi everybody, welcome back to Borderlands 3. My name is Mikey Dubs, and today we are continuing our quest for the perfect roll Skull Masher. The Skull Masher is a 5 projectile Jacob Sniper that drops from the Tink of Cunning or from Ice of the Invincible. We will be farming from Ice of the Invincible. And perfect parts go like this. These body accessories always stay the same, so we're not worried about it. The barrel accessories, and this is part of the reason why my odds are better than last video. The barrel has to be this barrel, but it always drops with two accessories. I thought it could potentially drop with one. It always drops with two. So the barrel has to be the damage slash crit barrel. The magazine, I will go for any magazine, either four, six, or eight. This is the eight version. The scope needs to have this crit damage accessory. This stock is actually wrong. This is supposed to have damage on it. And this foregrip has to have damage on it as well. Let's get this job done. If you missed the strategy from the last video of how we're farming this, we are going to Zyde Largos to the Skittermaw Basin, where Ice of the Invincible spawns. And we are going to be fast traveling to a point right next to his spawn location. If you do not know, when you first defeat Ice of the Invincible, his loot will drop on the ground. And then he will ask you to revive him. If you do not revive him, then every time you reload the zone, his loot will still be on the ground, but it will actually be a new instance of loot. So he'll get free loot, uh, loot refreshes every time you save quit or reload your mayhem back into this zone. So if I go into this mission, see how my mission says we slash part three. I have not revived him yet, so I don't want to revive him, but his loot will remain on the ground here. See that? Pretty, pretty cool. So if I save and quit and come back, then that loot will still be there. But we take it one step further. If we, instead of going to check the gear, instead just save and quit our game, we will take that instance loot that was lying on the ground next to Aista, and it will go to our lost loot machine. That means that if we sit here and reload the zone enough times, we will be able to fill our lost loot machine with legendaries. And the quickest way to do that is simply just to swap your mayhem, which also refreshes the loot. And each of that counts as a raid boss run because that loot is going to go to our lost loot machines. Every 20, 30, 40 runs or so, we're going to be checking our lost loot machine to see if we got the drop we wanted. And that is the farm. The odds of getting the perfect roll are 1 in 599. So... The Skull Master that I have right now is very close to a God Roll. The only thing that it is missing is the proper stock. Everything else is exactly right. The odds, 1 in 599. Again, that is updated from the last time because I had a misunderstanding of how the barrel parts work. We're looking for a Dastardly Skull Masher. The Dastardly prefix means that it rolled with a proper barrel. It is possible that we get a Skull Masher that's about the same overall damage and usefulness as our own that isn't dastardly but dastardly just gives you a a small glimpse into whether or not it is perfect without having to actually see the weapon itself so we're looking for dastardly skull mashers farming with mouse and keyboard but also swapping over to farming with controller you can do this on console with controller maybe even faster you won't have a fancy run counter like me but you can always do tally marks next to you that's basically what i'm doing I just hit a, num a hit number pad or hit um, the number eight on my number pad on the right hand side, which I have key binds in an OBS. Pretty simple counter. And we just open our menu, change our mayhem, go up one, 109, and we'll get to 10, 20, 25. And hopefully, hopefully we can get ourselves a nice early skull masher in this video. That way we can go ahead and showcase it mayhem i said in the last video that maybe we'll get 100 runs in per video i'm hoping to, to push past that um now that we have a very good idea of exactly what parts we're looking for we can we can kind of supercharge how quickly we do this farm now we we want to be careful because if we do too many runs the lost loot machine will get filled up with guns that are not skull mashers and some of our skull mashers will get kicked back to the front of the queue um, that is my understanding of it, at least. Or we'll get kicked out of the Lost Loot Machine. The last thing we want is our Dastardly Skull Master God Roll to be kicked out of the Lost Loot Machine in favor of something newer or higher loot score. I know that the class mods, I think, might take precedent over these snipers. Because when I do empty the Lost Loot Machine, it's almost always snipers and class mods. Now, 
Aista, our raid boss, has two dedicated drops. They're both snipers. One's the Skull Masher. That's the one we want. And one is the Cocky Bastard. They're both Jacob snipers. So we can't get too excited when we see a bunch of them pop out at the end. Half of them will be a weapon that we don't necessarily want. We're going for the Skull Masher. Maximum damage potential. Okay. That's a quick breakdown of what the farm is. And the reason you're here and the reason I'm here is because we like grinding weapons. If you like doing intense farms that you know might take the normal person a, a long time but you don't mind the weight if that just adds to the overall value of the farm at the end of the day and this is the place for you we farm stuff we let people see what we're farming the parts we're farming for the odds the runs and we i, I try to make sure the odds are exactly correct um basically all i do is multiply the amount of uh, available parts for a denominator i make a fraction so the denominator is all the available parts for each weapon group so if there's four grips you just take four times um if there's three scopes you times three if there's five stocks times five that's your denominator and then the numerator is how many of those weapon parts are acceptable so if there's only one grip out of four that's good you don't have to worry about the numerator but if there's two grips out of those four that i consider good enough for my perfect skull masher then the numerator does go to two. So we take our final numerator divided by our final denominator, and that gets us to 599. Okay. So we're at 120 runs. I think what we might do is at 25, at 25 and 25 run increments, we will go back to Lost Loot Machine. If we do 25 and we're noticing that's not really getting filled up in that time, then we will go to 30 or so. Let's get the 25 and see if we can get ourselves a Skull Masher. You really don't have to do... This is a nice farm because you don't have to do any combat. Once you defeat Ice of the Invincible the first time, and I... It's not a very... Not a very tanky fight at all. I basically one-shot it with my light show fade away. Once you get rid of him, then just make sure you don't revive him and do this strat. You can also do this strat by not using the lost loot machine but instead running using a snow drift to run over to where Ista is and check the farm out this seems like it's faster to me we are basically getting a boss kill every single time we swap our mayhem which is super super nice instead of having to farm something like the tink of cunning which can take forever our plans after the god roll skull masher because i mean we're getting it um i think what i think what we might be doing next is getting a a like a rack attack peregrine like a mage caster build flak thing going with unleash the dragon the fish slap the peregrine class mod all right let's do one more go to 126 because we did get one without the lost loot machine even though that legendary probably would go to it let's go to sanctuary actually what i might do it in thirds let's do 33 We'll call it 33, and if, and if it's full, we might cut it back a little bit. We'll get to 133, then we'll check the Lost Loot Machine. We're going to be spamming this as fast as we can. We want to get the Skull Masher, and then I want to get enough Iridium to re-roll it with a decent anoint. Probably a uh, fadeaway action. Uh, yeah, fade, while fadeaway is active, plus 150% weapon damage. Probably best. I, don't, I really don't see another one being better than that, so... That'll be the anoint we are looking for. We're not being picky, though, when it comes to the anoint, because if you want to take that 599 number and multiply it by... I mean, there's 58 anoints, so 1 in 58. You know what I'm saying? The odds of actually finding it are very, very small. We'll, take, we'll do this one, and then we can farm the Iridium, and then we will take, I think, the expected Iridium cost for... A non terranoid is like 1 in 14,000. We'll get ourselves like 15 to 20k of radium and try to reroll for it. Again, I'm not too worried about the anointment as of right now. And I'm not worried about the magazine size. However, I'm worried that if I get one that's too small magazine size, that I won't be able to use it. But the, slower the smaller the magazine, the more damage. But it's something for us to think about, ponder. And once we get our hands on a skull masher, if we like what the four magazine one is doing for us, then we'll be we'll be fine. But the eight magazine is 
kind of what I want. I like I want six as well. Fours I'm a little bit worried about, but if I start using it and end up liking it, then that'll be what we go with. So let's travel to Sanctuary and check our lost loot machine. La da dee, la da do, la da dum. I actually to get this to get this farm unlocked, I did get myself a new pearl of inevitable knowledge. But it's just as bad as my old one, so it is full. Okay. Got ourselves there's just there's a skull masher, but you can tell immediately that it's not the right skull masher because of the blade on it. But look at all these look at all these bad boys. Alright. Let's just start picking them up, and I will drop them all at once. I just want to get them up and off the ground. Okay, any more? Yeah, got ourselves some skull mashers. Okay, there's a dastardly as well. So we're looking for a dastardly. Here's one. These parts, this, it doesn't have the right stock. We're going to inspect it anyway, see how close we got. It's not the right stock. It is a six-round magazine. These will always be the same. It's the right barrel. Very nice. Magazine is good. Scope, we did not get the crit damage one. It needs like a little wire piece. We did not get the right stock. And the foregrip is correct. Nice. We got That's a decent mag or a decent skull masher. Any other dastardlies? No other dastardlies. And all these other ones have a bayonet. This is, I believe this is the wrong barrel. Or oh, that's a cocky basher anyway. Okay. We can drop them all. A couple of friendly trainers. I don't see anything that great on those. Anything, weapon damage. Damage reduction on that trainer. Mm, I could probably get something better. Okay, let's head back to Aista. Let's go to Xylargos. And we continue to get our round counter up and up and up. We can just go right to this Clan Amoret <laughs> save station. And I believe I have to reset my mayhem and then we continue on going. My last two videos were pretty fun to make. I did a Borderlands 2 versus Borderlands 3 discussion video. Like everybody else has done in the past, but everyone else gets to talk about it. So I get to talk about it too. And... The last video was me setting up this farm, going through the all the details, similar to how I did it just now, but a little bit more in depth. Unlocking the fight, going through the DLC, coming back. I didn't record through the DLC. Um, I did a little bit of it for. I don't. I shouldn't be leaving. I should just be swapping out my mayhem. There we go. So that's one run. Swap out my mayhem. There we go. Let's get ourselves to one hundred and sixty-six. Last two videos were fun to make. I've been, my semester has started up now, so I was able to push a lot more content out when my semester was down, but I have my wedding coming up. So get the planning for that is going. And then my, my workload for the semesters, uh, higher than most semesters, I have my senior research class, which is basically you have to work on a project the whole time, but it's, it's not like, oh, it's a project where you can just sit on it and not do anything. Like, if you do that, you'll just fail it. So you have to keep working on the project because that's how hard of a project it is. So I basically just have to write a giant paper, a history paper. It's not that big of a deal, but it's just a big paper. I think 25 to 30 pages on something that is unique. So it's going to be about perceptions of China or Western perceptions of China. That is the name of the class. So I have to pick something that, a topic that, involves how people think about china and how people have thought about china and history and then discuss it whether it's right wrong whatever how, whatever point i want to make i can make whatever point i can say that the perceptions are true i can say that the perceptions are false i can say that the perceptions are misguided and led to this action or maybe i can tell it because the perceptions were so correct that this happened you know i could say anything and since i spent some time in the marines and i've done a lot of um uh, military history research i was thinking maybe doing something like something revolving around the korean war in specific maybe a specific battle that changed perceptions a lot of times i feel like if a country goes to war or something like that and a battle doesn't go the way they think it should and all of a sudden now you're kind of in a slugfest with that other country you might start seeing newspapers and magazines and stuff posting propaganda and if I can find it, 
and I can prove that it only started after a certain battle, I can maybe point to that battle as like the turning point in Western perceptions of China. Like beforehand, they never saw anything like this derogatory towards them. But after this battle, that just so happened to be a big loss or stalemate like the Chosen Reservoir. My theory is that the Battle of the Chosen Reservoir marked a sh perceptions shift from the United States and other Western countries to China. But for this paper, you don't want to be getting, you don't want to be too broad, because if you get too broad, then you won't be able to read the right sources. And then you won't be able to get the paper done in time, because if you spend all of your time reading sources that don't give you anything, then you'll be kind of screwed, which you can. But luckily, if you read the wrong sources, a lot of times you can get enough background info to develop a brand new thesis, just because, you know, when you start reading about a topic, you learn a lot more about the topic and you come up with new questions. But for once in my life, it would be nice to have a thesis going in that actually made sense and had some sources for it. So we're, I'm going to be doing a deep dive into the Western perceptions of China this semester. I also have a, I have a challenges and issues facing healthcare systems class. That should be pretty fun. I have an African American politics class. So that one should be pretty good. That class seems good. My professor, he seems, he's definitely energetic. He's definitely energetic and he's been teaching for a long time so he just postponed our first assignment because he said he was he liked how much energy we brought to class so in pog champion no assignment too but that being said he does seem very serious like if you're late to class he will scold you pretty heavily and he's he's been saying that the doors are gonna lock uh at us once the class starts he hasn't done it yet but I think a part of that might be because we we have too many students for the classroom that we're in. So he said we're moving classrooms next time. Like, look, I know I'm just data dumping to you guys, but like this is what's going on with me. Look at look at my farm right now, okay? I want to get this guy real skull masher, and this is the route I have chosen. I'm not going back. I'm not going back to think of cunning. <laughs> Give me the skull masher, baby. Um, so that should be good. And then the final class is urbanization in Latin America. So I've got, a, like, a, I'm a history major. I've got lots of history stuff going on, but very, like, social heavy, perceptions heavy, that kind of stuff. And a lot of, it's going to be a lot of writing, right? So I, I do prefer writing to taking tests. I'm not really, like, a midterm exam kind of guy. I, I do usually do very well. My grades are, are pretty good. I think, I think my GPA is sitting at, like, a 3.8 something. It's almost all A's heading into my senior year with... I think three B's. Um, I do well with exams simply because they stress me out enough that I just cram and I get stressed and all that stuff. Whereas papers are more just like I can let it flow and then go back in and see if anything was messed up, right? I usually, like a, like a scripted YouTube video where I write a big long script and then as I'm reading it back, I'm finding problems and I need to get as much evidence and support into that script as possible so that one, I can be informed and interesting. And two, I can, if someone questions me, or if, if they have any doubt in their heads, I can address it in the paper. And that's something that you really want to go for. Is if there's like, if you're trying to express an idea in a paper, and someone immediately has like, well, that idea doesn't make sense in my brain because of this reason. If you can address that reason in your paper with substantiating evidence for the contrary, or just by just surrounding that person with as much information to your side as possible it doesn't have to be persuasive but most of the time in history you are writing to add something to history right you're writing something to correct some uh, something about the master narrative that's wrong or you're trying to make an addition to the master narrative and again the master narrative is the generally accepted idea of how things went down in the past So the reason you call it the master of narrative and not just straight up history is because as we know, history is written by the winners. History is biased. History can change so dramatically and it's not everything is as it seems. So the, the reason you use a term like master narrative is to express the idea that not everything that we know about the past is correct. Despite how much evidence we have found, we can be fairly certain of things that happened, but we cannot be always entirely sure.
as a historian, you try your best to find, accumulate, report on, distribute good information based on very credible sources and as much primary sources as possible, like things that actually are from the time and place that you're talking about to help you. Like if I can find a coin minted by the U.S. government that has a that has like a let's say an eagle with a purple an eagle with a, a a pink ribbon on it right for breast cancer awareness i can make the argument and let's say let's say the quarter that that coin came out in 2020 100 years from now i can make the argument hey in 2020 the united states was was pushing for breast cancer awareness because look at this coin i found it has a pink ribbon which back then and now like future me would say back then and now the pink ribbon is a sign for breast cancer awareness like i need to if if it to make, in order to make a statement about what happened or how people did or what things are in the past you, a lot of times you have to go back to the past find something that would make your argument believable find something that makes your argument credible and if someone comes along after you and says actually i found the documents of the design of the coin and it wasn't for breast cancer at all in fact it was supposed to be a red ribbon for something else but some of them got misprinted then you know that is the kind of thing that can change the master narrative but the master narratives change when new evidence is found and sometimes people have different opinions on what evidence means so there's always sometimes you get differing opinions on the same piece of evidence from credible scholars so history is very complex and it's it's this history that that tells a story of a place you know well looks like it's full after 33 runs okay Come on now. Pick up all the skull matches we see, even if they're not dastardly. It's like all iron willed. Flame a diddle, friendly trainer, storm trainer, 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 trainer. Dang, that is tough. That is tough. Alright, let's drop all these bad boys. This skull master has a blade, it's not good. This one has a blade, could be better. This one doesn't have the right stock, neither does this one. What is the barrel for the trick? Does it have the proper barrel? It does. So the trick skull masher has the proper barrel. The wrong scope accessory. So I think we can go... I think trick and dastardly are both strong enough. Trick and dastardly are both strong enough to be the best. I have to keep my eyes out for trick skull mashers. So I don't necessarily care if it's crit damage or regular damage in the barrel. And I believe the name of the gun comes from the barrel. Okay, let's head back to Ista. That Largos. If you can't tell, I'm a bit of a history nut. It was always... It wasn't always my best subject. But it was almost always the one I was most interested in. Again, I, I do do well with things like statistics and, and math. Um, some sciences. Not... Usually not chemistry, but... Again, I only learned chemistry in high school one time. I don't have to I don't have to run over there. I can just do a brand new run. Hey, what's up, buddy? <laughs> okay. Let's go to Mayhem. Swap it to eleven. Bring it back. 167. So we're hoping to get this within 600 runs. Um We're at 23 minutes and we're almost I mean we could we could push 200 runs an episode if if we're quick about it. If we really push this, we can go 200 runs an episode. And that is a real goal that we could we could obtain, you know. Let's see if we can do it. 168 now at 24 minutes. Um, episodes are going to be about an hour long of me just yapping my gums, so. Let's do it. Mayhem 10, swap. 169. We're going to be stopping at 199 to go check. And then, yeah, I... I honestly think that if we do it this way, it'll be good. I don't think we're losing any any skull mashers to the to the lost loot. I could be wrong about that, but I don't think we are. Although that many class mods dropping from this guy makes me think that maybe some of my skull mashers are going to the lost loot machine. I might be better off. And again, I I don't haven't read the comments from the last episode. I'm recording this back to back. Um, I haven't read the comments from the last episode. If someone is Let's me know, like, oh yeah, by the way, lost the machine, no go, because all of your 
all of your skull mashers go away but to me it feels like i'm getting a good amount of skull mashers doing this for every for every 33 runs i'm expecting usually about five skull mashers which is what i think about what we've been getting if we start if we start seeing less than three skull masters on several runs i mean i'm not sure how many standard deviations it will be from the norm i could start collecting the data and try to see if it's we're getting a normal bell curve for our data points if we start seeing a bell curve that doesn't look like a like a standard uh liberty bell and we start seeing a lot more on the low end that means that they're getting kicked out i could start taking those data points down but i have faith I don't want to have to run the numbers against the system. 176. Very nice. But I'm excited for this semester. I think I don't have many textbooks. I only have to get one textbook. And all of my professors are anti-electronics in the classroom that include includes laptops which is huge i love that because not only do i never get in trouble for being on my phone because i'm not obnoxious with it like in a, in a college classroom if you just check your phone um and be like an adult no one really bothers you but the really nice thing about that is that i don't have to lug my laptop around because i prefer to take notes on my notepad anyway just a regular notebook just take my notes that way yeah, like in the first couple of weeks, your hand might cramp up a little. But after that, like it is free, free, easy note taken. I'm doing the, the classic notebook folder matching color strat. Where I have a green folder, green notebook, red folder, red notebook for the different... The different subjects which is pretty cool i mean i haven't done that since man since like i first started high school because book covers once once book covers started to change you guys remember book covers how you take this book sock to protect your book well once the, the pattern started to get all crazy and they weren't solid colors that's when my color system started to started to shift right once instead of because he didn't have he didn't want to keep it going out and buying new book socks obviously so if you got like a tie-dye one or something like that then then that wouldn't match any of your simple colors now you could brown bag it i did a lot of brown bag book socking where you just take a simple brown bag and you a brown paper bag and you wrap up your book in that which that works pretty well but the colors don't really come out that great on brown bags plus i who wants to color their brown bag? Just put the bag on it and give it a name. So it's been a long time, a long time since I've done color coordination, but I'm, I'm excited to do it this semester. Staying organized. That way, if I get papers for class, they have somewhere to go. <laughs> and if I have notes for class, I have somewhere to look. I've been using, for all my classes, I've just been using like one notebook. And then once that notebook runs out, I just get another notebook and I just keep the same notebook for all my classes and just title just title it for every single time I have a new class, just make a new title. So if I go to four different classes, I'll have four sets of notes in one in one notebook. It's 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 pretty unhinged, especially if you're trying to study and you have to keep like flipping pages back and forth and back and forth. I usually keep a, a little little bookmark on on one of the pages and then a little bookmark on the on the other, or I put my finger on the other so I can flip back and forth really fast. I'm trying to you know, do my homework or anything like that, but luckily, luckily, I don't have to do any more math. I'm all done with math. I have one more, one more natural science to do, but then I'm good. And once I'm done with this semester, my capstone will be done. My history 400 one, a big one, my Western perceptions of China, and then it'll be. Smooth sailing to my bachelor's degree. I will still have some college credit um, paid for from my GI Bill left over after I get my degree. So I might use that before I lose it. 
um, to work towards a master's or a second bachelor's or something like that. We'll see. I think that could be a good idea is working towards a master's in education or something along those lines so I can teach at a higher level. Or if I get lucky, find a job in some other sector. But we'll see. That's what's going on in my life. Let me know if you guys got any updates in your lives. Again, getting married in a month. Preparations are coming to a close. Things are... A lot of the those auxiliary elements are, are starting to work themselves into the bigger picture of the wedding. And then we'll be about ready for wedding day. One of the biggest parts is for me is that where am I going to get my hair cut? Because the place I go is nice. It's cheap. But I don't know like a place around here that's guaranteed to give me a good haircut. I like to get a fade on the side. Keep the top a little bit longer. So I can at least comb it over, but... If I can't do that, then... <laughs> if it's not going to be looking good, then who knows what I'll do. Alright. 198 this is this is one of those runs where you remember it forever the, the reason i kind of like this farm is because it's so unique so unique you're not you're not gonna find many farms there like this where you just you swap your mayhem and then you go to the lost loot machine to check and swap your mayhem go to the lost loot machine to check like this it's it's not gonna happen and the only reason i found this farm was because i was i was looking up skull masher how to farm videos and I knew about the, like an Ista trick, but I didn't know about the lost loot machine portion of it. And I only had one like on Reddit. This guy only had one upvote on Reddit for that, for the strat. Which is ridiculous because of how efficient this makes this farm. Alright, let's see it. 200 runs in. If I get to 600, I'm going to start crying. Trust me. If I get to 600 farms and I don't find one, I will start crying every farm. Where is it? Where is it? <laughs> All right, lost loot. Let's see what we got here. Skull masher me. That one has a blade on it. Can't get any skull mashers this time. Oh, class mods. Oh, that one looks. Dang it! It's not even a skull masher. We got one. We got one. Okay. How is it? Iron willed. And I don't believe that's the red right stock. That one's too curvy to be the red right stock. Got the wrong barrel. The wrong stock. The wrong foregrip. The wrong scope. That That is what we call a bottom roll. <laughs> An absolute bottom roll. Okay. And I believe there's anything else in here for me. So we only got one skull masher from that grouping of 33 runs. We're, think we're supposed to get around five. But you know what? Sometimes you don't get... Sometimes you don't get... I, sh I should really be taking notes and create a, a scatter plot of this data to see if we are getting a standard distribution. That being most of the time we hit our five mark if we're doing 33 runs. But if we don't hit the five, we should be getting some with six, some with seven. But some with four, some with three. Getting one twice now makes me think that we're not getting all of our lucky sevens. Not not lucky sevens. All of our skull mashers. So I think maybe we're getting cheated. Maybe the game doesn't want us to win. What I could do is run over there, check every single pile to see if those skull mashers show up. And then, once I get to over 15 legendary items, maybe say, let's get to like 25 legendary items, see which items come back, come out. See which items come out next. We shouldn't, the Lost Loot Machine shouldn't be getting that full. What I might do is drop my runs. Let's try, let's try, let's say tw one, uh, 25 runs. Let's do 25 runs this time, then reset and to see if the Lost Loot Machine will be full. Because if I can get to that point where on average, I just got it full. Then I'm sure that I'm not losing any Skull Mashers. So this time around, we'll go to 225. Check it. See if it's full. I want it to be either just barely full, which I won't be able to check. 
or partially full to the very, very tippity tip. Okay. Very, very nice. It's been a while since I've given any sort of sports update on any of my teams, so here we go with that. The New York Yankees are doing very well. I believe they're top of the AL East, but last night, Carlos Rodon picked up a nice big old L against the 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 Nationals. I think it was the Washington Nationals. But Aaron Judge has been picking up his home run and hitting to the point where he's like on pace for even more home runs than his crazy like 62 home run season or 63 home run season. He's just an unbelievable player. But one of my buddies has been talking about how DJ LeMayhew is an absolute liability out there, which which is sad because DJ LeMayhew used to be one of my favorite players in the team. He was, I think, batting first or second, and he was absolutely teeing the ball off. And now I think he got injured, came back, has never really performed exactly the same, which is sad. Jose Trevino, the team's catcher, he was an all-star last year. He came off of his injury and is starting to replace a player that's been playing super well, Austin Wells. Austin Wells has been batting cleanup and doing very, very well. But he lost his cleanup job to Giancarlo Stanton because Giancarlo Stanton came back from injury. And then he lost his, a lot of his catcher minutes to Jose Trevino. So that's a bit of a bummer for Austin Wells. But, I mean, he, he was given an opportunity to prove himself both at catcher for more time and he did well and an opportunity to prove himself at a higher spot in the batting order at cleanup and did very well so austin wells took advantage of i think of his opportunity and is going to is going to be doing a good job for years to come it is it is tough because jose, jose trevino was an all-star last year but i don't think he swings the bat as well and if you don't know in baseball catchers typically Sometimes it's true, sometimes it's not. But historically, I think catchers have not been the best offensive players. A lot of times, they're slower players. I think, on average, the catcher is one of the slower players around the bases. Um, if you ever see uh, catchers' legs, like their thighs are like it's mountains. They're huge. Sometimes catchers can bat with some serious power, making them great th uh, three hitters or cleanup hitters. That's the four spot. But most of the time, the catchers are used to command the defense. Their job is to always catch the ball from the pitcher, if you, even if it's a crazy pitch. Block it. Um, make sure that you can throw up guys who are stealing bases. And then if you can generate some offense, then that's a bonus. However, when you get to the major leagues, you're, you're competing against more and more catchers that can play defense and offense. So the standard is a lot higher once you reach the major leagues of how good you have to be in order to play, especially on a playoff team. You can't just be good at defense. You have to be good at defense and offense. And being good at offense in Major League Baseball is extremely hard. Those pitchers, they throw some serious, some serious heat. Um, almost every pitcher is throwing fastballs over 90 miles an hour, 95 miles an hour. A lot of these pitchers are starting to hit over 100 miles an hour pitching, just like not even thinking about it. So... It's tough to hit. On top of that, these guys also have great command of their other pitches. Sliders, change-ups, sinkers, curveballs, knuckle curveballs. There's a new one called the sweeper. Some guys rock... Um, some guys rock knuckleballs. Like, you got a lot of these pitches where you have to be ready for a fastball, but then you'll get another pitch that looks like a fastball off the hand, but it doesn't go as fast. That's the change-up. Or you get another pitch that looks like it's coming straight in and then it dives off the face of the earth. It might be a sinker. And so in order to hit that tiny little ball coming at you that fast, you have to have some crazy hand-eye coordination. And to hit it with some gusto, you got to have some big strength. So these, these major league athletes are, you know, they're extreme athletes. They are, for, they are for real, for real. They are the real deal. Especially ones that hit it with some consistency. I mean, that takes... That takes some real some real ability. A good Major League Baseball player, it depends on the year. Sometimes the league batting average, so like how many plate appearances, how many hits do you get per plate appearance? Sometimes the league batting average is high, sometimes it's low. But in order to, for a player to usually be considered like 
very very good the mark that you want to hit is 30 percent. so 30 percent of the time that you're up there to bat um you get a hit if someone's hitting that 30 number then you know that they are actually we made to 226 there that's my bad then you know that they're performing very well if they're but sometimes the league average isn't th isn't isn't that high and sometimes the league average is like 220 something so you gotta i'm not sure if it's ever that low but you have to take into account that some years pitchers are just dealing some years batters are just hitting there's there's a, so many different factors to determine how good someone is hitting you can't just take batting average there's a lot of other stats i like o, uh, obs on base plus slugging percentage what's it this is completely full okay let's see okay a dastardly skull masher times eight forty thousand Make sure we grab all these sniper rifles. Wow, that's a lot of cocky bastards. Any one of those could have been a skull masher. Looks like we only got a, one skull masher. Two. Three. Okay, so let's... Let's see. I, I don't believe this unflappable has the right barrel, so we won't... Yeah, so the unflappable is not the right barrel. But this dastardly might be pretty good. And the Iron World has the wrong barrel as well. So let's try this one. This one has the wrong stock. Let's see how thin that stock is. It has the right grip, wrong scope, right barrel. So let's see. Right barrel. The OK Magazine, I'm fine with the times 8. No st scope accessory for extra crit damage. Wrong stock. Right foregrip. OK, that's another, that's another grouping. And honestly, I felt like we didn't get cheated that time. And drop everything on the ground. And head back to Aista. Okay, let's start swapping our mayhem back and forth. This is, again, this is a completely PV uh, or just a non-combat farm. Which is completely fine with me. Like, how many times do you get to farm with absolutely zero combat? Especially an extremely good weapon. And it's still a grind. You know, this, this is still Borderlands. Let's do it. You know, Major League Baseball is a lot like Borderlands, right? If you're doing your runs... And you expect to get yourself a skull masher on one in 599 runs, and you start to get to round or to run number 800, 900, 1000. You start thinking to yourself, you know, I'm kind of getting gypped here. And when you're expecting a player to bat 300 or 280 or 250, or you expect them to play without making errors, and they're just they're they're too far away from this from what they are being paid to do, then you start considering, you know, replacing them and. I'm not saying I'm going to be replacing this farm, but what I am saying is you have expected value or expected outcomes when it comes to these probabilities. And when you have like a player who doesn't perform to that, they can get easily replaced. On to, on to my NASCAR update. So remember how I said last time when I was farming my King's Call that Austin Dillon, because his, his spotter... Was screaming wreck him wreck him wreck him right before he wrecked two drivers for the win and cost himself a playoff spot which just barely helped my favorite driver ross chastain stay above the cut line well at daytona a random driver won who hasn't won yet and when you win a race you automatically in the playoff so he just harrison burton jumped up and took a playoff spot away so that's just one less spot for all the drivers who are trying to make it in on points instead of winning and ross just stands on that cut line so Basically getting gypped out of a spot because all the drivers in the field were wrecking each other. Kyle Larson, I, I, I swear this guy is wrecking guys on purpose. He, Kyle Larson is the type of driver who won't hit you himself. But if he, he makes it look like it's an accident, but he knows it's going to wreck you. I, I swear this guy is involved in so many crashes. And I'm happy he didn't win. I, I'm, I'm hoping that Kyle Larson doesn't win a championship ever again. But I would rather watch Kyle Larson win one. I would rather watch Kyle Larson win every single championship than watch Joey Logano win one more. Oh my gosh, that driver puts me in total snooze fest. Total snooze fest. So it doesn't look like it's going to be a good year for Ross. Even if he makes the playoffs, like... I just don't think that he has the car or the ability this season to win against a lot of these drivers. A lot of, good, a lot of really good drivers going out right there. Christopher Bell, Tyler Reddick. Denny Hamlin, Kyle Larson, Chris Buescher, Brad Kozlowski. There's a lot of good drivers out there right now that are 
that are winning races and if you're one of those drivers that thinks you're going to make it in on points like Bubba Wallace or Ross Chastain you got some big dogs to get through because you're going to be at the bottom of the pile so part of me you know is like Ross is take it easy but another part of me wants to be like Ross always makes the playoffs so we got one more race left it is going to be Darlington and Darlington is known I think they call it the the Black Widow or something like that um it's known for being very unforgiving where the way the track is angled the sharp turns the high speeds it just makes it very tough it is an oval lee track i don't think it's like a road course like Watkins glen or anything like that it's an oval lee track at the very least but the way the, the way the angles are it makes it so that if you make a mistake you will crash and i believe how it really works is that the fastest line on the track the fastest way to go around the track is as close to the wall as possible right so if, if you go up to the high side of the track so the far right of the track and you get your car right up next to the wall i think that that is the fastest way around the track now the the dangerous thing about racing up next to the, to the wall is obviously if you make a mistake you hit it not only will that slow you down but if you hit it too hard that can cause damage to your car and if you hit it too hard, you can ricochet off the wall and wreck drivers, especially drivers that are right next to you trying to pass you or right next to you side by side. So if you go a little, a little bit too far, hit it, you can cause yourself some damage. And what we see in Darlington a lot of time, I feel like, is guys getting squeezed up on the wall. There are so many drivers wanting to play up there or wanting to race up there that when you come off, when you come around a corner and everybody has to line back up in the straightaway, some guys they don't give you the room that you need to be up there they'll squeeze you and they, they, you can cause a wreck doing that because the guy that you're squeezing against the wall has options they can lift otherwise known as hit the brakes to allow you to take away their airspace because you're taking up two lanes in, instead of allowing for a third lane to exist on the high side so they can they can break and slow down and give you the spot they can keep driving straight and be squeezed against the wall and cause damage or they can turn into you and wreck you and put you in the wall. It's something that we have uh, that we saw Bubba Wallace do to Kyle Larson a couple years back when they when they got into their kerfuffle. Darlington's going to be crazy. And, I mean, Daytona was crazy, too. We saw a ton of wrecks at Daytona. A ton of wrecks, including another car flip over, which is a big thing going on right now. Apparently, like, NASCAR's having problems with cars flipping over. So right before Daytona, they installed, like, this, like, shark fin that basically it's like a, a little piece of the car that flips up when it starts catching air to hopefully block enough of that wind flying around the car to stop it from going out of control all right that's the least goal measure me that's a joke right okay i was gonna say there's my skull mashers right that's really skull masher looks like a very high damage Unflappable is what we're looking for. Okay, let's see it. Let's check out that skull masher. Oh, it's got potential. Oh, it's the wrong. It's the wrong stock. That is unfortunate. Okay, let's make sure that we. Here's one. This one has the the right stock, the right grip, the right barrel, and I think that's the right scope. Let's check this out. We might have ourselves a winner. Barrel accessory, crit damage and damage, perfect. Magazine, we take it's minus damage, but it has eight rounds of the magazine. Scope accessory, critical hit damage, ten percent. Stock recoil width and damage. Stock accessory damage, four grip damage. Ladies and gentlemen, and run number two fifty, we get ourselves a god roll skull masher, eight round magazine. It's an absolutely unbelievable roll. And grants an extra charge of rack attack. You know, that's not really that bad of an anointment. Getting an extra stack of rack attack. But I think I will be going for a reroll on it. Let's see if I can get my reroll in the first 3,000 Iridium. Okay, I'm supposed, supposed to cost me about 14,000 to get a, a particular augment. But I don't think I want rack attack. So let's drop all of our old ones. Goodbye. And we got it very nice the dastardly skull masher damage rolls across the board nothing i would change about it almost fifty thousand damage times five 
Let's shoot this bad boy. Pretty pretty high recoil in general, but if I swip, swap to mouse and keyboard, I can control a little bit better. Very cool. And I get, because I'm using the Jacob's Company Man, I have a 17 round magazine. Again, the bigger the initial size of the magazine, the more bonus I get from the Company Man because it's percentage based. So now I have a 17, a 17 shot Skull Masher and each shot only consumes one ammo. So I, I just do ridiculous damage. I don't have to reload basically ever. All right, let's do it. Skull Masher, fade away, damage me. Ooh, we do have, you can go U-Rad. I can front loaner U-Rad, but I'm not going to do it. Fade away active weapon damage. You gotta be kidding me. Fade away active weapon damage skull masher. Wow. All right, let's go to the slaughter shaft and try this thing out with a build that is completely designed for it to function. Let's do it. Okay, first things first, let's see how this bad boy does against Grave Ward. I have a stack butt on. Glows in the mist. Oh, yeah. That is good stuff. That's without even hitting an actual normal crit. Okay, Grave Ward gets absolutely one shot. Beautiful. Let's head over to the slaughter shaft and see what we can do there. Okay, I know I said that we were going to go to the slaughter shaft, but look at the time in the video. It's 51 minutes. Don't have that much time. So we're just going to head over to Athena's and let's do this. All right, get rid, get rid of the odds on the screen. Oh my gosh, that's a one shot. This is no revolter, by the way. No revolter at all. Oh, later, kid. Look at the accuracy on that bad boy, and you're getting one shots. Oh my goodness. Let's go. Jeez. Now I can shoot this thing 18 or 17 times. You can run up to someone and then hit him like that. Very easy. Later, kid. And sometimes I even get ammo back. Later. Oh my gosh, I finally have a sniper. Nice. Hey, get out of here. I have the Cosmic Stalker on for mobbing, and I have the the stack bot on for bossing. Cosmic Stalker just makes my, all my hunter kill skills more effective. Jacob's Company Man, Frozen Heart for a shield. Athenus doesn't stand a chance. Now, Athenus isn't the highest overall, like most difficult area in the world. But I'm so happy. I'm like, I'm so happy that my God rolls an eight magazine one. Like this one's one of the first things I, I said in my original, Skullmasher farm video was like, I I would kind of like an eight round mag one. Like I'm, I, I don't necessarily like a lot of the so so called God rolls that we see in this game, just because their magazine size is too low. If like I'm if I'm playing like Moe's or something like that, sure. Like I want, and I have ammo regen, that's fine. But realistically, I would much rather have something like this the higher magazine so that I can spam out shots a little bit faster. Now, if I get too low on ammo, I can always swap back to a terror build. Oh, don't go down here. There we go. I do have some health regen. I'm a little bit low on ammo. I can always pick some up like the old, the old, like the old days. Maybe doing three shot fade away could be the way too. There we go. Let's pick up some ammo from, from some crates. Look at that. No ammo. <laughs> and look, the ac accuracy is really not that bad on it. Oh, see you later. <laughs> oh, oh, man. He did not like that at all. Where are you? You're up top? Got it. Well, let me just uh, open up some of these and get some sniper ammo back. This game hates me. Look at that. No sniper ammo. Crazy talk. I have to climb all the way up. Here, give me some of that ammo, please. Another Good night, kid. Silent. Wow. I'm... Despite being so low on sniper ammo, I'm actually getting... A little bit gypped. Let's keep it moving. Trant, I'm coming for you, buddy. Oh, there's, there's some sniper ammo. Beautiful. And I could always just swap back to terror. And you know what? What I might do is let's just go terror. Stop gap and terror and do three shot fade away shenanigans because the it has five projectiles on this bad boy. Let's do, I think I like until you're dead. And... Yeah, pet taunt. We don't need... I don't think we necessarily need, need pet taunt. So let's just do these two. Now we got three shot fade away that will activate terror once it's over, which will add bullets back to the magazine, which it won't necessarily save our save us entirely, but I think it will be very good with that bad boy right there. I don't want to be reloading so much. There we go. Get some terror going. 
So because I have terror regen on my shield and terror creation on my Grenage, I can use terror on any weapon combo. I would like to get like an old god or something like that with terror regen. Right now I have a stopgap, which I think the stopgap is good. I'm pretty sure right now I'm immune to all damage, which is nice. So like my mag isn't going down at all. Let's take a shot so we can get our action skill up a little bit faster next time. See how that terror is helping me? Just maintain my magazine even when I'm low. Getting yourself a nice terror shield and a terror grenade only takes a, a, a little bit of time by farming a vendor. So farm a, a grenade and farm a health vendor for a little bit. Get a, a shield that gives you ammo, ammo regen while terrified and get a grenade that generates terrify on, on action skill end. Bada bing, bada boom. If you have a melee build, you can bypass the action skill end and just go for melee damage can terrify you instead. A little bit more efficient. Here we go, terrified. And because we have the eight round magazine one, we can actually maintain this a little bit better. If I had the four round magazine one, forget it. Forget it, it would never work. Later. But because I have such big magazine size. Oh, see ya kid. I actually get a lot of value from Terrify. And Marigen, of course. A three shot fade away. Oh, baby. Luckily, I think Tront has a... I believe that Tront has an ammo vendor right next to him. So we don't have to do this, but... Oh, later. This is, again, the only sniper rifle I think that has this many projectiles, or... I mean, this is just... It's just so, like, consistent. You know? It's the max damage. Max damage, Skull Masher with the max magazine. Look at that. Beautiful. And we're still max magazine. Three shot fade away is the way. A lot of time, I feel like. For at least for ammo regeneration. Alright, bring it on. Any badasses for me? Here we go. Okay, what you got? We go nine shots left. But we're gaining more ma more ammo than we're spending. <laughs> Control disconnected. I haven't used it in a while. I feel, I feel like the skull masher is more of a, a mouse and keyboard weapon. So here we go. We got an ammo vendor here. And let's go ahead and slap on our revolter, our mitosis hunter seeker, and our stack bot. And change our action skill to gorillas in the mist and unblinking eye. All right, Trant. Uh, if I were you, I would not be very excited about what's about to happen to you. Yeah, look at that. It's absolutely one shot, Tron. Like he's not even there. Okay, is there is there a boss I can I can go try out real real quick? He's pretty tanky. I could try I could try to do a tink of cunning, but it might take me a while. Um. Here, let's let's open up my map and try to get to somewhere. I mean, Dark Thirst Dominion. I could I could spend the extra iridium. Let's try it. Let's go. Because I'm not gonna have enough ammo to deal with something like. To deal with something like Emo Boris. But you know what? Let's try it. I mean we have terror we have terror if we need it. If we go that low on ammunition, we can always try to get some back. Let's just do it. Spend the 500 iridium that it takes to open up this fight. Since we saved so much iridium. Let's go ahead and reload. Since we saved so much iridium on the rerolls, you know what? We will give the game back some right here. Unbelievable that we got that in so few rolls. Weapon uh, fade away active damage. All right, we're gonna stick with Stackbot. I think it's gonna be a little bit more useful than the than the bounty. Uh, sorry, the Cosmic Stalker. As long as we keep critting, we have to get the Great Horn Skag pet out as well for damage and crit damage. Let's go. Not a whole lot of elemental damage going on here. We do have the Revolter put on for bossing purposes. Okay, let's go, baby. Emovorus. Good night. Oh, wow, the one shot. Okay, Hemovorus Larva. Make sure we just ping it. There we go, one shot. Come on now. Good night. Ping it. And what's really nice about this weapon is it, it's it's like the Monarch, and it's like the Lucky 7, and it's like the Light Show, where the extra projectiles come in so handy. We don't want to shoot a whole lot unless we have our stack bot, but then again, we have to shoot to get our stack bot back. 
So, yeah, let's wait for the next one to use our action skill. He should be done with whatever he's doing right now soon. Right? Are you not immune right now? Yeah, he should be... I'm not too sure. Okay, there we go. Yeah, he's in his... He's in a super badass pod now. 137 rounds remaining. Let's use our action skill. And the, the more we, the longer we can go while not um, accidentally not critting, the more damage we're going to do. Okay. Now the Mitosis Hunter Seeker will reset our stack bot, but at the same time, it also will get us back our action skill faster. All right, here comes our first real burst. Let's see how we do. That's not bad. It's not insane damage, but it's not it's not bad. Okay, let's try to get our stack bot back up and running here. Come on now. We want Hermivorous. Okay, we could have I think I feel like we could have done more there. Come on, get me there. Get back my action skill faster. Okay, good. My pet is still alive, which is a good sign. He keeps he keeps running away from me. I'm gonna go to Vermivorous. Both of them keep running away from me. Running out of blammo. Hang it. Yeah, he does a lot of AoE, so it looks like it's not a one-shot boss kind of weapon, but it's a really good it's a really good option for taking out mobs and such. Maybe if I can hit my if I can hit the crit spot, I might be do a lot better here. We're gonna have to switch to terror. Yeah, we gotta try to hit. Okay, my mic fell completely on top of me, but I think we are back up and running. Okay, that's pretty good damage to him all right there. You see that? That's pretty good. Let's wait for our action skill to come back up. Get some mitosis hunter seekers going. Okay, 17 rounds. Let's see what we can do here. Okay, get around. I can't quite see that crit spot, but we're there, kind of. Stack bot me, come on. Without that stack bot active or that revolter. Do I have my revolter on? I should. Yeah, I mean, we should be getting maximum damage here. So, I'm not too concerned. That's not bad. That's really not bad. And now that his armor is gone, maybe we will be able to shred the HP down a little bit, a little bit faster. Almost running out of ammo, though. Gotta keep it moving. Keep it moving and grooving. Oh. Go ahead, Pat. Come get me. Thank you. You didn't even get me. I got myself, but it is what it is. Okay, let's go. Keep it up. That's not bad damage. Pretty good chunk. Oh my gosh, yeah. Once they start once they start shooting all that, all that other jazz out at you, it becomes really difficult. Okay, six rounds remaining. Pet is somewhere around, I'm sure. There's an enemy over there somewhere. I see you. Okay, two rounds remaining. Enter fadeaway. Hopefully pick up some more sniper ammo. Ah, oh, man. He keeps going underground, making it really hard to get him. I keep swipping, swapping the wrong weapons. There we go. It's on weapon number three. I keep forgetting that. Woo! Man, these attacks are hard to, to dodge. And luckily, I'm playing Flak. Get down, go down, go down, go down. Stack bot, come on, help me out here. Let's get this guy back on the ground. That was so helpful. Okay, we good? Oh man, this fight is tough, tough. Can't see that enemy over there. Oh, we're so back though. Pet, come, come save me. Yes, can't die on black. It's not possible. Okay. Vermi's on the ground. We got a nice, decent shot on him. For some reason, he's immune to something. Go down, Vermi. Don't like you. I hate you. Those some mitosis hunter seekers out there. Clap, 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 clap. Okay. Enter revolter stage. Commit, commit, commit. There we go. <laughs> we definitely committed. Do I get a reset on my timer? Looks like I might have right there. Man, this is intenseness. Let's go, baby. What a fight. Okay, get away from where I was. It feels like they can track me wherever I am. Oh, yeah. Let's go. Yes. Vermi. Good night, Vermi. 
You're going down. No, 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 no. You are going down, friend. Yes. Okay, run around, crack some blammo, hopefully. Where is... Wow, 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 wow. I'm going to say, where is my boss? There he is. Okay. Take out some of these laddies. I thought I was invincible to the shock damage. With the revolter on. Hey, revive me. What well, pet's taking a lot of damage from this pool. Okay, I need to run away once I get back up. Where is this guy at? Right there. So I, I take a lot of damage from sources that I'm not too sure where they are. Like, I feel like when I'm in fadeaway, I should not be visible. But I this guy definitely sees me or something. I could maybe slap on pet taunt, but then I would have to get rid of gorillas in the mist or something along those lines. There we go. I can actually see him now. Go for that crit spot. See how I'm taking damage? Like, even though I'm in fadeaway, it's like I'm getting targeted by something. There we go. We got a lot of ammo regen now. Here we go. Should be it. See how he tracks me? Yeah, look at that. He tracks me even through. But there we go. Hemovorous, Vermivorous. Down. I mean, we went down a bunch of times, but... We could have made it a little bit easier by giving our pet taunt. How about a nice company man? Didior. Oh, yuck. Okay, rocket pod and a dead ringer. Okay, that's going to be it for this video. Thank you all very much for watching. If you enjoyed, hit the like button. Subscribe to see more videos like this one. We got ourselves the skull masher. God roll. Very excited to use it on future fights. I'll see you all in the next one. Bye.